to the bus uh, stop because mm. my bus was leaving in there less than five minutes. Okay. Yeah, we made it. <laughs> and that's almost like, oh no, I need to stop smoking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, he needs to. <laughs> I thought we were meeting with Vidal uh, today. I thought I thought tomorrow. Oh. Didn't we say Tuesday? <laughs> <laughs> I, I swear, if I lose this book, I lose my life. I have no idea what's going on. I'm going to have this book. See what they say. Uh, oh, I did write it down. Huh? Okay. I guess my book should help me at all. Yeah, we're meeting with her on Wednesday. Yeah. Hello. Hi, how did you know? When was it? Uh, North Park. Uh, mm? Oh, she had to be happy. Do you have a voice? Yeah, I hope that they're back for another podcast now. Yeah. From there. Sorry. Just in the cafe, I guess. Are you? Are you there? Are you just here?
Tubo. Olena. Ja. Sandra. Hanna. Nadja. Mari. Jocelyn. Tona. And Chris. Hello. Oh, hi. Okay, that was. There we go. Okay. Are the other ones, are they still on research crews? Is that what it is? Okay. And that's just the end of this week, and then, and then uh, things are more or less back to normal. Is that correct? Okay. Um, on Friday, a, you were supposed to meet with your groups, and I had to send out a, 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 an email because not all of it happened the way I was expecting it to. But this is this is exactly what I figure. You know, you give one message, and you think it's really clear to a hundred people, and you've got 99 versions of that one message, and a couple of people didn't get it anyway. So. Which group did not meet with their TAs? You guys. And you do, guys. Do we have a TA now? Yes, you do. Okay. Isn't it Francesca? Weren't yeah. you agreeing to meet with her? We haven't we haven't met her yet, so we can she was back. Oh <laughs> she yeah, but she told I saw a mail directly to you guys. Yeah, we saw that after. We yeah. Just didn't know we had a TA, so Right, okay. I hope that. you're meeting her today. Um, we can try or at least, yeah, make a real effort to meet with her today. Okay. And and you guys didn't meet with yours either. What happened there? Oh, we concluded on our group that there wasn't any. Yes. Right. Answers. Yeah. See. Yeah. Okay. So who's your TA? Hayang. Huh? Hayang. Hayang. Oh, okay. I think it'd be worthwhile to and get directly in touch with him and uh, and have a talk with him. Also because. Um, as some of you don't know yet, uh, the, um, the the TAs when they're doing their PhD, they're supposed to know all the stuff you're going to go th you're going to go through. But also, um, the TAs ha have uh, an extra year because they're supposed to have teaching duties. And for many of them, the first teaching duty they have is being a TA in Bio 300, and that means that they haven't got a teaching style. They don't know how their teaching style affects you, and they don't know how clear the messages are that they give to you, and what helps you and what, and, and what doesn't. So there's a dialogue that has to go directly between you and the TAs to help the TAs get better, not just for you, but for themselves. And that's, that's an explicit part of this course, because TAs are not automatically good at teaching, as some of you have already exper experienced. And uh, TAs have different styles. Some of them really know their stuff. Some of them have been doing this for quite some time. Hi. Um, some of them have been doing this for quite some time and they know this, but some of them have this for the very first time and don't know anything about the style that we're going to. And also because this is, uh, this is more or less tradition, uh, uh, traditional here, but it's not a traditional course other places. So please get in touch with your TAs and sort of make that little group there because they will be able to give you feedback in a way that you won't be able to get any other way and they need your feedback on their style so that they can improve because when, when they come out of their teach, uh, out of their PhDs they're going to be competing with millions of PhDs around the world and many of them have only the science as a background and they need the teaching uh, experience to sort of uh, separate themselves out from the rest of the crowd, and there is a crowd at the other end of the PhD. So it's helping them as well if you get in touch with them and start talking to them, like, for real. Okay. Um, uh, the other thing, how's it going? How's it going with your, uh, I, I'm still plowing through the re results, so I expect to be able to give them back to you by tomorrow. Um, but how's it going? You're doing your, your introductions, right? Yep. And is it easy to find the stuff that you're wanting? Not yet. Okay. You're at least getting through some stuff and you're making notes? Yeah? Okay. Um, some of the, okay, the, uh, the, the part today is about the non-written part because from now on uh, you're going to be preparing the written in purely scientific manner, what you're expecting, but you're also going to be starting to prepare the, uh, the 
presentation which is completely different from the written stuff. But some of the groups have already got um, a, a guide to help them make the, the final presentations, and some of you haven't. But uh, from, I'm going to give a little idea session today about how many ways it can go. How many, how many of you here have gotten a, a guide already? Okay, so half. That's, that's about right. Yeah. And the other half um, are going to get something else. Now let's see. Let's see if we can get this one here. Hope it, hope it works. Um, and and just, so that, just so that you know, um, I hope the sound works on this, because you can see at the top there I've lined up lots of stuff. Okay. And if the sound works, we're good. And if it doesn't, we're screwed. Um, but uh, for those who are interested in science communication, there is, at Stony Brook University, there's a center for science communication. Um, and Alan Alda um, is this guy here. Let's see. Do we get it? No, of course we don't get it. Uh, Alan Alda did. Uh, let's see. Where's the one? Is it there? He's, um, he's an actor, he's this guy here, who you may or may not have seen on, let's see, might go to something better? Of course not. Um, he's, uh, he's been on MASH, he's, he's Hawkeye in MASH. He is um, one of the characters in West Wing and he's been in quite a number of movies and so on. Let's see, just let's see if that works. The Center for Communication oh, Science is located at Stony Brook University and works in collaboration with Brookhaven National Laboratory and Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Some deep question. Just, just for a second, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory is, is run by um, James Watson of Watson and Crick, the double helix. So this is Cold Spring Harbor is, they have, su uh, at summers, they have gatherings of the best scientists all over the world and they're talking about the top line stuff. And the reason why Alan, uh, started all this is because uh, his friends, our scientists, were generally very interesting people, but he was really shocked and dismayed at how badly scientists communicate. ...have been raised in our society that affect all of us, and the contribution of scientists to that discussion is vital. For example, how dangerous and how immediate a threat is climate change? How will we manage the next pandemic? Can we harness technology well enough to protect our oceans? How much regulation should government impose on stem cell research? It probably has never been more important for the public to understand science. Hello, my name is Howie Schneider, and I am the Dean of the School of Journalism at Stony Brook University and the co-chair of the Center for Communicating Science the first center in the country devoted exclusively to training current and future scientists on how to communicate more effectively with the public, the press, and public officials. Okay, so my point with this, in fact, is that uh, I was there. Um, and a couple of years ago, in 2012, um, I, I went there particularly for their fall workshop and I stayed there for, for a couple of weeks afterwards to see how they integrated it into the classrooms. Uh, and this was a, a, a course that was not aimed at students. This was a course that was aimed at people who are dealing with uh, other scientists, other heads of, uh, heads of uh, organizations. And so on the student side, there was the NASA's communications officer. Notice how NASA's been going up lately? NASA's communications officers were there. Carnegie Mellon University's outreach was there. The old heads of the National Institutes of Health, they have billions of dollars to work with, they were, they were on the student side. A writer for David Letterman was on the student side. Uh, journalists for the American Chemical Society, uh, Harvard-educated clinical neurologists, a whole bunch of other people, and we, we, we looked at each other and we said, the teachers can go home, we're going to have a grand time. Because we were so full of stories about what our work was about. And on the, stu on the teacher side, we had, of course, Alan Alda, we had Pulitzer Prize winning writers, we had actors, we had 
uh, old, uh, long time producers of CBS, the news program 60 Minutes. We had CBS television journalists and so on, and we had a lot of workshopping. So the ones of you who haven't got the artistic guides, you're not getting anything worse when you're getting me. Okay? And, and just uh, oh, one thing I haven't loaded up, just to show you this. Um, you know that, just to change the focus here. Um, You know that I was at a I was at a conference, right? There was several hundred people there, um, and uh, all about aquaculture. And I managed to get, you know, what I managed to do. Will it go? There it is. I got in the news half an hour after I spoke. I was in the news back here because it's it's that. Uh, and of course, it's in Norwegian, so you can't read it. But what I what I'm trying to tell you is. The techniques work. I can't always steer what message comes out, but uh, but it does get there. Hi, Winnie. And uh, and the point about using this science technique is that, or this science communication, is that when you're talking to the audience, I'll just scroll down a bit. If you want to see it there. Okay, that was it. Um, when you're talking to the audience, the audience is going to talk to, to other people. And when I, was, when I put the, the talk together, yes, I ran through a lot of stuff, but I also know that the PowerPoints that I make ha have a tendency to live their own life. So they, they sort of go off into some other stream of distribution, and then I have the audience in front of me, and then I have the audience that I want to take. Th so there was a couple of journalists that were in there, and one of the central ones for Norway was also there. And I'd made the point clearly enough that, uh, you know, I left the hall and there was basically a little microphone and a pad in my face, but I knew, I knew the guy from before. Um, and uh, and he, he understood the impact of what we were doing and wrote this little tiny thing, which meant that for the next 36 hours, this was the most read article on this site and one other, which is sort of in it. Uh, it's into Norwegian fish farming, which is one of the things we're doing. But so this this way of using science communication, it doesn't mean that I'm making a film. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm making a podcast. It does mean that I can talk to scientists and make a journalist realize what I'm doing. So there's the trick. And I can make a journalist realize what I'm doing quick enough that he can summarize it in that much. And the data behind this, the data that I showed, there was thousands of data points. But he got the point. He got a point. There's many other points to be made, but he got a point. And that's the, uh, that's the idea about this, about this uh, science communication. So the, there are many ways. <laughs> there we go. Uh, there are many ways uh, of doing this. So. Uh, one of the ways that people talk about science communication is sort of like a little flash in the pan. So I'm going to show you this. Um, and this uh, is a, a flame challenge, explaining science to an 11-year-old. And who's a who are the teachers in here right now? Sigri and who else? Anybody, any other teachers here? Not this morning. Ooh, you're going to have a hard record. Anyway, um, uh, the 11-year-olds are the judges of whether or not this works. This is just, uh, oh, that's a promo, let's see. Uh, this was the first one. Uh, the first ever flame challenge, what is a flame? And it's, it's a really great winning thing. Take a look at this. Science, I think, was something that came for me naturally. It was this general. Come on, I want to get into the thing. Go to ask. So show, me. Uh, show me. Show me. Show me. Shit. Show me. Alan Ald explained. Then there are smaller things. There oh. should be smaller no, things. No, that than one's that. not going to be it. Let me see. There, this is it. Hi. Oh. Excuse me. 
Pardon me. No, 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 not out there. I'm down here. Yep. Hello. I am a scientist, and I've come to improve your situation. See that fire over there? Have you ever really wondered what the flames are from that fire? I mean, look at all of those colors, and you feel that heat. It's hot, right? Well, gee, it must be torture being around all these flames and not knowing what they are. Here, take a look at this cupcake. Do you see the flame on top of this delicious looking cupcake? You do like cupcakes, don't you? Let's take a closer look, shall we? Fantastic! If we look at the flame on top of this cupcake, we first notice a few things, like all the colors. At the bottom, we have this bluish color, and the top, is more yellow, orange, and reddish. Also, the flame is hot. Why is it so flaming hot? Well, to answer these questions, you need to know something very important. You see, everything is made of the tiny things called atoms. And these things are the building blocks that make up everything. And they're really small. Smaller. Smaller. Even smaller. Hey, look, you can't even see them. They're so small. Exactly. Anything you can think of is made up of atoms. Yep, this air conditioner is made up of atoms. This delicious popsicle is made up of atoms. This ice water is made up of atoms. Everything is made up of billions and billions of atoms. Now this candle and flame, well, they are made up of three kinds of atoms. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The carbon and the hydrogen are locked together to form a solid wax and wick. The oxygen is a gas all around us. Normally, the oxygen doesn't do much to the candle. It just bounces off of the surface, not doing any real damage. But when we add heat, the oxygen atoms go bananas, and they shake the wax like crazy, until finally, with enough force, they snap apart. They leave the candle as a gas, where they mix with the oxygen. Uh-oh, I smell trouble. Well, the fancy science word for all of this is pyrolysis. It's the first thing that needs to happen to get a flame. It's when the fuel turns to a gas. Now, let's see what happens when these hot gases combine. Ladies and gentlemen, in this corner, he was once a solid. Now he's a gas. He's the fuel from the wax. And in this corner, not one, but two groups of oxygen. Ready? React! Anytime certain atoms get hit hard enough, they spit out blue light. And because there are lots of atoms getting hit hard, and lots of atoms spitting out blue light, we get a blue flame. Here comes another science word. Ready? Chemiluminescence. I know, it's a big one. One more time. Chemiluminescence. It's when atoms shine light when they rearrange. It's why flames are blue. Now the blue light is not hot. Wait! But the blue flame is really hot. So if the blue light is not the hot part, then what does make a flame so hot? Well, remember our fuel atoms and our oxygen atoms? They rearrange to make blue stuff like water and carbon dioxide. And as they rearrange, they snap together. And with each, the new things shake like crazy. So when the rearranging is done, we have lots of new stuff, all shaking really fast. If we put something close to those raging atoms, well, those atoms begin to shake like crazy, too, like the atoms in our finger, and that's heat. This is called oxidation. It's when the oxygen atoms combine with other atoms to make new stuff. It's why flames are so hot. All right, then. Why are most flames yellow, orange, and red? Well, remember our first reaction? We had one group of fuel atoms and two groups of oxygen. They made a flame that was very hot and only blue. But watch what happens if there's not enough oxygen and we take some away. Ladies and gentlemen, what happens when there's not enough oxygen? What's this? A single carbon atom left all alone? It's okay, because all of us leftover carbon friends come to join and they form large black particles we call soot. Okay, they're not so large. They're so small, we can't even see them. But to a single atom, they are enormous. Enormous! I know what you're thinking. How do black particles make yellow flames? Well, let me show you. But first, I need something big and black, like this pitchfork, for example. Excuse me, sir. Your evilness, could you please place your pitchfork into those scorching flames? Thank you. 
Big black objects are like sponges that soak up heat. They have to get rid of this energy, so they spit it out by glowing. The hotter they get, the more brightly they glow. Now the same thing happens with our soot particles. They drink in the heat from all of those hot atoms, and they glow brighter and brighter until they look like this. And because there are millions and millions of soot particles all glowing hot, we get this yellow flame. This is called incandescence. It's when the soot particles glow because they're hot. It's the reason why flames are yellow. Well, that's it. That's what flames are. I mean, the new cupcakes could be so much fun. Remember, first the fuel loses mass and turns to a gas. Before the next change is through, atoms shine blue. When the process is complete, it gives off heat. Extra carbon will glow red, orange, and yellow. Hey, those are just like the lyrics from that really awesome song about flames. You know, the one that goes, The fuel loses mass, it turns to a gas before the next change is through. Some atoms shine blue, when the process is complete, it gives off heat. Extra carbon will glow, red, orange, yellow. The fuel loses mass, it turns to oh, yeah. gas before the next change is through. Some atoms shine blue, when the process is complete, it gives off oh, yeah. things to try and explain to 11 year olds but this is where you got to get this combination of the facts that you already know with a way to put it across that is clear and I'm sure all of you learned something new about flames today and you thought it was still going to be the same old same old and really boring and not express it now you know now you know and it was a pretty straightforward thing it explained what is flame <coughs> So there's, there's uh, even, a, even a sort of simple question like that can come up with really unique ways of answering the question. Because all of us, all of us have gone through chemistry class. All of us have used a flame. None of us have seen it explained like that before. And now you can be 11 years old and understand exactly what's going on in a flame. And it touches on so many things, not least the composition of uh, the basic material that's going into that flame and how it changes. So there's, when we're talking about the communication of our results, it means, it means a great deal to the audience what format you put it in. Now this is for 11 year olds, but it does, it is very interesting how, you know, even the little stuff, yes, it's amusing, and you wouldn't use this necessarily in a science presentation, but it would work. And certainly these are, for, for the teachers as well, these are really good ideas because it turns it around. It does take whatever it is, is pensum or required reading or the plan or whatever it is, and it answers it. You know, you're supposed to be doing that, but you can use other examples. You can use completely different other, uh, other examples. And when you're, one of the, one of the things that, uh, about it is, uh, is that you start to connect to the audience. Um, and uh, lots of people end up talking with, for example, teenagers. And teenagers, they're basically only halfway there because their hormones are raging away. But anybody teaching biology to a teenager could use this book, Dr. Tatiana's Sex Advice to All Creation. Okay, so this is written like, this is written by uh, Olivia Judson. She was uh, one of the, is one of the science contributors to The Economist that regularly has a really, really good science section in there. And uh, this is written like uh, advice to the lovelorn. Like you've got uh, uh, 
uh, you've got uh, some problem with your love life and you write in. So, for example, and I'm just opening it because anywhere you look is, uh, is something. Dear Dr. Tatiana, it's a fiasco. I am a hopeless male three-spine stickleback. I was watching my eggs when I heard a sudden noise. I turned to look, just for a second, and when I turned back, all my eggs had been stolen. Who would do such a terrible thing? And how can I prevent it happening again? A stickleback, that stinks it. Okay, and she goes, uh, and it's signed by, want my eggs back in Vancouver. Egg pirates, it's an old problem. All you can do is remain vigilant. The trouble is, in many fish species, females prefer to lay eggs in a nest that already contains some. They take the presence of other eggs as proof that the nest is safe, that the male who owns it is particularly manly, or that he's a good parent and unlikely to eat his babies. Success spawns success, you might say. And in sticklebacks, it often spawns a black market in eggs. I don't mean you get ready looking fellows selling stolen eggs in the rundown parts of the lakes and streams. No, the thief keeps the eggs for himself, taking them to his own nest so he can pretend that he's a breed of super dad. Why are sticklebacks particularly vulnerable to egg theft? We don't know for sure. It may be that the eggs are easy to heist. Unlike the eggs of most fish species, stickleback eggs stick to each other in a convenient portable clump. Something like this goes on in the cloud forest, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you have that. Um, another one, dear Dr. Tatiana, I'm a true army worm moth, and I've gone deaf in one ear. I read this is from having too much sex. Trouble is, I'm still a virgin. So what's happening to me? Peaked in Darien. She writes back. Be assured, you have nothing to worry about. It's just that your inner ear is now hosting a torrid, incestuous orgy. Remember the rhyme you learned as a caterpillar? And now there's a poem. A moth who can't hear at all in one ear is probably quite a home to a mite. Dicrocles infest when the moth is at rest, an unlikely event, mites never pay rent. Yet once they're on board, they're all in accord because they've learned to perfection through natural selection or heard from an oracle to invade just one oracle. For a moth who's stone deaf to the ultrasound clef is lunch for a bat. No doubt about that. What happened is that one evening you stopped to sip nectar from a flower. A mite scrambled up your tongue as if it were a ladder. When she reached your face, she crawled through the tangle of your scales and hairs to the outer caverns of your ears. After inspecting both, she chose one and crept inside. Then she stepped up to the delicate membrane, the tympanic membrane, that screens off the inner ear from the outer ear, and she pierced it. In doing so, she destroyed forever your ability to hear with that ear. After settling in and perhaps taking a light supper of, I'm afraid, your blood, she started to lay her eggs, about 80 in all. A couple of days later, the eggs hatched, the little larval mites wriggled backward out of their eggshells, and the first to emerge were the males of the brood, and then came all their sisters. The males grew up faster than their sisters, preparing one of the innermost galleries of your ear as a bedchamber, carried their sister brides there, and even helped them out of their old skins as they finish their final molts into adulthood. And it goes on. So there's different ways of approaching the topic instead of being really dry. If anybody wants to take a look at this, it's got all kinds of stuff in there. So there's di different ways of putting the topic across. So when you are writing about your own results, you have to be able to think, okay, nobody was out there on field work with me. But what I did was really important. And the ways to get it across are very, very many. Um, for example, okay, uh, j just following on the uh, teenage stuff here, anybody know this one? Anybody know Isabella Rossellini? You'll recognize her face probably. Daughter of Ingrid Bergman, and she was uh, one of the, if you've ever heard of uh, the film called Blue Velvet, she was in there. And she's got a little series. If I were a female, any female, I would want to protect my precious eggs. I would want to hide them in a hole, and I would want that hole to be in a place hard to reach. Unless I want you to reach me. Penises. Different penises. 
all trying to get as close as possible to my eggs. But I would have a tunnel and it would be a labyrinth. It would be intricate. It would be unique. It would be species specific so that I'm not screwed by a bear. Penises, species specific, each one unique to their respective vaginas. A cozy fit, like a hand in a glove. If I were a barnacle, a semi balanos balanoids, I would have a shapeless body and I would be stuck to a rock. I would have to develop a long, long penis. To reach inside a female barnacle. The best position is to be in the middle of the group. Let me stay in the middle. Let me in. Let me in. The most dangerous position is to be at the periphery of the group where I can be easily eaten. Ah! Ah. By luminescent effect and by changing shape, I can communicate. I can say, be careful. I can say, I love you with my whole three hearts. I would give the most passionate 20 arm embrace. 20, 18, two are not arms, if you know what I mean. I would slip my spermatophore, a package full of sperm, into her spermateca. Ah, oh, I would have to get undressed, get rid of this tight armor, I would have to molt. And when soft and naked, I would mate. Ah. Oh. Mm. So there's many ways of, of doing this. And uh, let me just make sure that this doesn't start playing. Uh, but there's there's scientists who do this in a very in a very good way, okay? Because what you write is completely different from how you say the results of what you did. Now, you guys know who this guy is? Who doesn't know who he is? Okay, good name. Would you explain? Um, he's a he's a guy who went around the ocean to sample different DNAs because I don't I, well I don't remember the history but okay you know. um, and his group was part of the team behind the mapping of the human yes. genome okay this is mm -hmm. Craig Ventner he's now uh, he, he's now private industry but he's a very very good scientist and entrepreneur and uh, basically took up the challenge of mapping the human genome quickly and uh, and cheaply more or less did it, was one of the first people to do synthetic biology, like making living organisms from nothing, or well, from the building blocks. And uh, now he's doing, uh, talking, the, trying to map the ocean's biodiversity, which is where lots of us are going. So let's just see what he says and how he says it. Okay, this is just the beginning. Where is the... At the break, I was asked by uh, several people about my comments about the aging debate, and this would be my only comment on it. And that is, I understand that optimists greatly outlive pessimists. <laughs> what I'm going to tell you about in my 18 minutes is uh, how we're about to switch from reading the genetic code uh, to the first stages of beginning to write the code ourselves. It, it's only 10 years ago this month when we published the first sequence of a free living organism, that of Haemophilus influenzae, that took a genome project from 13 years down to four months. Uh, we can now do that same genome project in the order of two to eight hours. 
So in the last decade, a large number of genomes have been added, most human pathogens, uh, a couple of plants, uh, several insects, and several mammals, including uh, the human genome. Genomics at this stage of the thinking from a little over 10 years ago was by the end of this year, we might have between three and five genomes sequenced. Uh, it's on the order of several hundred. Uh, we just got a grant from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation to sequence 130 genomes this year as a side project from environmental organisms. So the rate of reading the genetic code has changed. But as we look what's out there, we barely scratch the surface on what is available uh, on this planet. Most people don't realize it because they're invisible, but microbes make up about a half of the Earth's biomass, whereas all animals only make up about one one thousandth of all the biomass. And maybe it's something that people in Oxford don't do very often, but if you ever make it to the sea and you swallow a mouthful of seawater, keep in mind that each milliliter has about a million bacteria and on the order of 10 million uh, viruses. Which Less than 5,000 microbial species had been characterized as of two years ago. And so we decided to do something about it. And we started the Sorcerer II expedition, where we're, as with great oceanographic expeditions, trying to sample the ocean every 200 miles. We started in Bermuda for a test project, then moved up to Halifax, working down the US East Coast, uh, the Caribbean Sea, the Panama Canal, through to the Galapagos, then across the Pacific. Uh, we're in their process now of working our way across the Indian Ocean. Uh, it's very tough duty. We're doing this on a sailing vessel, in part to help excite young people uh, about going into science. So, it's worth watching this one, but it, it's, uh, what is it, 18 minutes? I'm not gonna use 18 minutes on that. But you see already, he's, he's just flashed up the headlines, he just flashed up the journals that they actually worked in. There were hundreds of scientists and years of work and immense amounts of detail that went behind his being able to say, we did, the, we did this, we did this, we did this. There was person years, many person years, behind his simple sentences. And he's just summarized it. And because he's got all these other details now, uh, you sort of take his summary at face value. Now, most people won't do that with you. They won't take your summaries for, for face value. And certainly I wouldn't either. But, uh, but it does mean that it's possible to say, to say very, very much in very, very little, uh, in very little time. And he had 18 minutes. You're going to have 10. He's summarizing hundreds of person years work. You're doing, you're summarizing the results of a couple of months, half a day's field work, and so on. So, frankly, it's doable, okay? So what you have to do is remember that the way that you are transmitting the data is going to make a difference to how people are understanding what you've got. That also means that what you've got has to be understood. So uh, we're going to take uh, a 10 minute break, when we come back, um, Please, we're going to do a couple of workshop ideas about what to, uh, how to go about it, because I know that you haven't even written your introduction, so you haven't even begun to see what, what you can say, but you have to start thinking this now. Okay, 10 minute break, I'll see you in a minute. Hi. My Stand back, please. I guess we should email our I'll do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we brought that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Ja, men det är så att det inte är så vi får inte att kunna hjälpa för den där ringen på olika och sådana här olika ting. Ja, det är alltså... Jag tror jag har snackat med någon på universitetet och så har du snackat med honom i sån så du har snackat med det här. Okej, ja. Så jag har vett där i. Jag har många spörsmål. Men det är sådana här ditt... Måt ni går fram för att utveckla ting, det är som inte så vetenskapligt så det är vanskligt för dig att organisera och sånt, men om du har något vetenskap du kan passera det på så kan du göra en utvecklande del av det. Ja, och dessutom så har du också en del sykdomar som må bökas på och sånt. Men Guy Lasse är först och stopp i stället, för han har så många i nätverket sett med mandater som blir uppdaterat hela tiden, så han är i och med att han är forskarledare. Men det är nog så vi fick däckning av ILAC, så är det med att vi får lite... Det kan du anledningsvis. Vi kan få det. Vi kan få det, men du kan i alla fall hänvisa till det. Och du kan, jag tror det är Guy Lasses sin e-post, det är geirt at gmail.no. Så det är en relativt lätt då. Ja, ja. Är du rädd för det? Är du liksom lite blyg för att ta en tag i det? Nej, jag var bara låst på kamera och skulle snacka med. Ja. Så... Och en av grunden till att vi har utanför som kommer att föreläsa till Bio 382 är nettopp för att danna sådana nätverk. För att de önskar kontakt med studenter och så det är exakt vad det är. Jag märker det att det finns någon för exempel från Lipe som har ett projekt som är intressant och är vanskligt. Men nu snackar jag och jag vet inte hur det är. Jag vet inte hur det är. Bente? Irene? Bente? Bente Torstensen? Ja, hon är huvud... Nej, alltså bio. Hon från Eiffels i bio. Kristian? Kristian. Ja, det är hon. Om man har en sån här studentkväll på NIF och sådär. För att de har ju väldigt mycket, för exempel det här insektprojektet, det här ser hon också som många syns det är intressant. Ja, och Irene, hon presenterade det också på konferensen där. Och det var en god del människor i salen, men hon fick inte däckning. Nej. Ja. Nej, akkurat det syns det är ganska spännande. Ja, ja. Jag snackade med flera folk som var involverade i den insektgrejen när vi var där. Ja, 
Right. Okay, men då vet du. Ja, jag ska ja. höra mig. Jag ska höra. Fylla på. Sensuell radiostemme. We need to figure out what we're going to do for our presentations. We think of being Inspector Morse, we should do. We need to be visual though, so I'm not sure what we should do. I kind of don't. I just feel like you know, it should be the graph for bad E. coli levels. I just picture him as a, like, the E. coli level red graph for <laughs> <Do I know? laughs> Can I say that Isabella Bingy yeah. was to Tove Jonsson's daughter? Ingen Bergman. Ingen Bergman. Ingen Bergman. Ikke Tove Jonsson. Ah, Tove Jonsson. It's a mumithal woman. Do you have mummies in Germany? Mummy? Yeah. They call it mummy as well? Do you have a coffee in Germany? Oh. I'm not quite sure if they call it Mimi or all over the world or not. Mumin? That's the Finnish one, by the way. That's not, that's not German, is it? What do you say? Oh, do you say Mumin in German as well? Yeah, because that's the Finnish one. Yeah. yeah. Fun fact. I lived with three Finn people, so there are Mumin mugs and Mumin plates and bowls everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. 
Men jeg vet ikke om du har penger i 10 minutter, ja. Jeg vet ikke om du har penger i 10 minutter. Da måtte det være skikkelig sånn her stygge opp. Det er et skikkelig spenningsmoment. Så kan ikke det liksom være at det ikke var noe signifikant. Det er noen levels i ekolet. Nå har det aldri vært bedre, for vi har et veldig superdramatisk resultat. Ja da, men vi kan vinke litt sånn det. Vi kan være litt stygge. Det har vi tenkt på. For det som er så morsomt, det er at kommunene mistenker som har nesten sendt det er kernspengen og at de avgjør seg litt opp for da. Men våre prøver, og kan vi ta det også før da, har vist at det er jo ikke noe hjelp med andre. Prøvene er helt tipt opp. Kanskje vi skal liksom gå mer opp av det. Konspiracy teori. Du kan vinkle på slutten der. Så da begynner vi å snakke. Yeah, we're definitely gonna trash Bergen Commune and London Town, aren't we? They put it as a goal. Yeah. I know. And further down, it goes rivers, but the really high levels of big hole. And yeah, it's especially a bad traffic area. So we assume that some overflow of sewage tanks, and we're gonna fix that. Hopefully you didn't. And I mean, it's about 20 years. Yeah, we're definitely gonna trash them. We're gonna be like. You should have some like starving African children and be like, they have it better than the children of this school if they drink this water. <laughs> right. Okay. So now I want to uh, I want to start getting you to think in a proper way. Um, and. Uh, and, and the reason why we're starting so early on, because your final presentations are on the 4th of December. And I'll be, uh, I'll be making appointments to meet with each of the groups that, each of the four groups that have me. Um, and each, every group will have about 10 hours face time. And part of it is to develop the story and how to get forward. Now some of you have already met your, met your guides and are doing something like that. Um, and have already understood how difficult it is to get the point of what you're doing across to somebody who doesn't know. Unfortunately, I know, but I'll, I, I will be uh, pretending I don't. Basically, what I want you to get, do now is, is get together, say, three or four t together in, in small groups, um, even if you're not from the same group, and start talking about, if you've got two people in, uh, two groups in your little five-person group, like, for example, uh, Tan, Merrick, Gudni, uh, Trigve, and Chris go together, and you guys talk about uh, what you've found in your results, and you girls go together, and you guys go together. I think we've only got four groups right here, more or less. So that, uh, for example, from uh, Yana, Winnie, Vega, Avon, and... Vinda, thank you. I'm all, I'm getting there. It works. Um, you guys go together, and then uh, Mari, Gudni, thank you, Ingrid, Egor, and uh, Prakash. You guys go together, and uh, and, and talk about uh, what you have found in your results already, and what you think it says. I'll give you about five minutes to talk about your results to each other and what you think it says. Oh, I'm going to want some uh, feedback and then we're going to start to uh, sort of workshop some ideas. And this is just the preliminary, these are not guiding, okay? So five minutes, talk to each other about your results and what you think it says. Oh, what are your results? <laughs> <I don't> know. <laughs> you know how I am, how I am and I will make it for myself. So we're really fine. Are we doing this over? Hello, Beth? I've been working with her. Apparently. Tell what you found. Tell the basic what you found. Yeah. 
We know you so sorry. Yeah, but um, um, previous years we have had um,
And they've known about that for four, 14, 20 years. And they've been like, oh, by 2015, we will sort this out. And it's worse than ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the role even the biology, yeah. They always had the same results as we do. Not news. <laughs> and it's right next to Appleton School for children between the age of six and twelve. Is it? Five and seven. I can show you. I mean, there is there is some fans for the children and there are some houses where just you know like bridges across the street and everyone can have a chance. I was thinking about using the girls. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm? <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> oh, um, septic tanks being flooded. So it's private septic tanks in the area. Um, and then whenever it rains a lot, which it does all the time in Bergen. Uh, they get flooded and literally just poop flows out <laughs> and into the streams. <laughs> we should make them like a show. One of us should be a stream, the other should just be like poop flowing. <laughs> Me neither, so. <laughs> <laughs> and then Yanuba, he, I see it's really tall, she'd stand next to be like this 7,800 E. coli bar. Just a red bar, <laughs> you should stand there and then we should have some poop flowing and you should be watching just like... <laughs> No, no. The ones that got a guide are doing the interesting work. Yeah, I know. We got, we got a guide now. And she's like, colors and playing and woo. And we're like, we don't have time for this. <laughs> she's trying to give us like homework for whenever we meet her. And we're like, we don't have time for this. Shit. So, Oh yeah, yeah, she's from his school. Yeah, she's doing like some masters in artistic communication design or something, something. Yeah. So yeah, so that's Yeah. <laughs> 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 
really oh, interesting so about them and the thing that this thing that that connect for each other mm -hmm. yeah. 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 okay so have you got some ideas now? Have you, have you at least told each other what it is and you found out what is un, maybe what you're saying is unclear? Okay. And so let me just, I'll give you like 10 seconds, just try and sum up what you've learned from the other people. Okay, so when you're talking, when I, when I want an answer, I don't want your stuff, I want the other people's stuff. So tell me what you learned about the other people's stuff. I'll give you about a, 10 seconds to sort of collect your thoughts. All good, right? Exactly. Yeah, we're good. We're good. We're back. Right. And then do like this. <laughs> Swim it away. I kept doing that at parties with people, and they kept being like. Okay, we'll start with you guys here. Um, Ego, what did you learn? What What did you understand from the others? And it it can be anything. What did you understand from the others? I understand. I. I understood that uh, levels, uh, equally levels, uh, uh, phosphorus, and uh, a difference that I'm also... A little bit louder. A difference of uh, water, the bodies which, uh, which were used for this analysis, and uh, <coughs> uh, for example, I, I um, I remember about uh, the results of Ingrid because she was first. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, they have a lot of uh, anger in this uh, small uh, lake. Yeah. Lele Lumbio? Lele, yeah. Yeah. And uh, what about the uh, last group? It yeah. was these two. Mm -hmm. Because uh, everybody. Uh, I remember that they have very, very high uh, uh, sample of E. coli, mm -hmm. which uh, I connected with uh, <coughs> private septic uh, crap. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Leaky, septic tank <laughs> leakage, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. I, uh, okay. Right. Okay, and uh, for example, um, Gudni, what did you learn from the others? Um, so. He was working on a lake that's being polluted and they've been looking at the streams coming in. So they've singled out one stream that seems to be different from the others and seems to be polluted, but they haven't concluded completely yet. Okay. Um, and then they were had different results, like the results weren't matching up, like the um, phosphorus, biodiversity, and E. coli results were were confusing with mm -hmm. each other. There was one side where it was good, but the other sides were kind of unclear. Yeah. And um, Chris, they had um, they had high phosphorus levels in uh, one site, yeah. and other than and they had also but they had low TCV levels. And um, they were looking at different. Um, they were looking at a stream for salmon, Trout. and it's, yeah, for trout. Trout, trout fishing. And uh, it was had seemed to improve since last year, but they only have two years mm. of data. Right, okay. Sounds like you guys were pretty good at summarizing your own results there. That was good. How about here? Uh, Sissa, what did you learn from the others? Um, they were looking at the... A little bit louder. They were looking at uh, the effect of receptive tank. Mm -hmm. uh, but they had very good results in the PCB and phosphor, uh -huh. but very low biodiversity, so it could be interesting to compare and see what the conclusion will be. Okay, so there's only one other project in your group? Yeah. Okay, that made it easy. Good. And um, how about uh, back here? Yeah, go ahead, Vivian. Yeah, um, there will, they were looking at the river muscle. Mm -hmm. The Hedicus River. They found that the water quality was pretty nice, actually. Mm -hmm. Both the phosphorus and E. coli yeah, samples were quite, yeah, showed good water quality, but still the water mussel, river mussel, won't grow there. Mm -hmm. And they don't know why. Probably the, I 
environment. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. And uh, what did the others understand of your group? Let's see. Yeah. Uh, Yana, you want to talk? What did? Uh, yeah. I don't remember where you were. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're looking at the recreational sites. Mm -hmm. uh, the results show that it's really good there. Mm -hmm. uh, no food extremes, no low E. coli, low phosphorus. So, kind of the intention of the, the field court or the field day show that it's good. Okay. It's a good. Place right for the, the target right and now if you notice there's been an evolution in how we're talking about this okay ego started off on e coli and phosphorus values and so on and then when we got to Goodney we were lifting up uh, lifting up and sort of focusing around and then when we finally get to Yana she's not even mentioning she she's sort of concluding with the site is good that's the way she opens and then goes down into the details right and that's, uh, that's basically what we have to con consider here now. You have to build your details and build your story out from the details that Ego started with. The E. coli, the phosphorus, the biodiversity, and whatever else you've got, the oxygen and so on. That is the basis of your story. And if you haven't analyzed that correctly, your story is going to go off into a completely different direction. But now, you're starting to build your story, and I'm quite serious about this, you're starting to build your story from another point of view. So probably by the time you get to the uh, final presentation, you're just summarizing some of the data, not in a table, but in a way that makes it connect very clearly to the audience about the particular site, the particular question that you've had. And that means that you have to take that sort of backward look and is this unusual is this good what other context can we see in this and th then you have to start building up okay who am I talking to and this is important who is your audience because your audience isn't 11 year olds despite the brilliance of the flame thing and it's quite clear that you can get complex ideas across to 11 year olds with a very easy way to do it and there are some in this group here who are being hooked up with some artists who will be able to do that without words and without numbers and get these complex ideas across to five-year-olds. It, it, it is that easy once you know how to do it. Um, it's, still, it's still work and it's still a process of development, but you can do it. And so when you're, when you're now building up to your final presentations, obviously we are a part of the audience, but there will be students from last year there will be Bowden Comuna as well. So you're, you're, the people who asked you the questions are in fact the audience you want to talk to. And they know nothing about what you actually did. So you're going to have to tell them what you did and tell them what you found and tell them what it means in a, in a way that puts it across that they get the message. Even if, for example, they are people who sit basically to fill out forms all day. Why is this interesting to them? What does it mean? What's, what are you going to try and tell them? And what does it mean about the way that they are sampling? What does it mean about how they are managing <coughs> the, the, the process? And what does it mean about how people in Bergen actually use the water? Or even, is there a, something similar about the, pro the problem here that you can find parallels to in other countries? Because this is not Mars. These are not a set of physically different parameters. These are global things. And so now, my question to you within the same groups is, how would you get the points or some of the points that you think you've already made? What would you do? And just discuss between each other. If you're trying to get these messages across to, uh, okay, uh, everybody knows Nina at, at reception, right? If you were trying to tell her, how would you do it? I'll give you five minutes. If you're trying to get your point across to her in a way that she understood, because she doesn't care what you did, in a way that she understood and thinks it's important, how would you do it? What would you do? And here, 
it's completely open. I, mean, I know I've combined some of the groups that have artists and some of the groups that are going to have me. But go ahead. Think outside the box. How would you do it? Go ahead. We would what were we thinking of comparing it to like the slums <laughs> in like the third world country? <laughs> Like children living here, like the um, refugee camps and stuff like that, and how bad the water quality is there. And then be like, you think that's shocking? And then be like, <laughs> your children might be getting the same water quality they drink from the I was thinking we should get like we should go to the school and we should ask some of the kids if they can manage to climb over the fence while we turn them. Just like this is how you see you can get kids. Let them rant. That's a that's a good story. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Because it runs into <laughs> us. <laughs> so I think the strongest point is the Yeah, I think you like really make it into documentary quests. I don't know. But uh, when it comes to non yeah. Yeah. the neighbor, the angry neighbor, saying that they like their basements were flooded for millions of kroners and stuff. Some kind of movie <laughs> on the quest and make it like as a copy of a really famous movie, like maybe Jurassic Park or something like that, where like the decoding just went in, like they they don't have control of the levels and now like hell is loose. <laughs> and can, like, we warned you. <laughs> How we would present it? Yeah, I think we're thinking of doing it like as a quest. If we're on this quest and maybe like into a movie or role play or something like that. But yeah. I think it's for the Yeah, well, we're kind of, kind of stuck in the back either way because we have to do the creative one, so this will take more time presenting it. Lucky else. So, um, <laughs> so, yeah, maybe like make it into some kind of quest. Oh, okay. yeah, like the boys were saying they wanted to do it as Lord of the Rings, but like <laughs> make it like a Lord of the Rings. <laughs> And then Soren is like, Soren can be like very good. I'm not kidding. I see a lot of smiling faces, and that's good. That's good. So, um, oh, it's a game. Yeah. We'll just say Fab. All right, let's uh, let's get down to a bit of work here. Um, there's been some smiling faces and some good ideas. Let's start at the back there. Uh, you guys, uh, maybe Winnie, do you want to come? Or Sondre, one of you? One of you. Uh, we talked about um, different things. Yeah? Uh, one of them was, uh, what I said was, um, try to make it interesting for for the girls who listen. Right. Try to make it... Uh, Try to make a person feel that it, this is actually something that means something. Yeah. That you can use. That's just a start to get the person interested in this. Right. Research. So you, you sort of aim it directly at the audience. Yeah. yeah? And, that, and, and then the problem starts on how to make this person actually understand what we're trying to find out. And then we talked about uh, making movies and documentaries. Right? Uh, in a funny way. We don't have the budget, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't actually remember how. I have a camera. Yeah? Well, it's not in a specific way, but no. like, just to make it easy to understand, and I think it, like, it captures the audience. Yeah? Uh, if you make it in a good way, of course. Right, so making it relevant. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And did you have any particular ideas about how you would make it relevant? Uh, <laughs> this is an yeah. evil smile. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, you mean you said something about uh, a news... Uh, well, make it attention grabbing, first of all. Like, okay. Like, breaking news. Right? <laughs> like, make it funny. With the okay. Humor. So there's, there's one of the ways. Yeah. Uh, okay, humor or attention grabbing. Okay, that can that can that can go against you. Just so you know, if it's if it's uh, <coughs> I mean, even even that word in the article about about my our stuff, 
Bonnebreitende, sort of, uh, what do you call it, breakthrough. I'm, I'm actually almost allergic to the word breakthrough because it often doesn't mean exactly what you wish it would mean. And in terms of, uh, in terms of halibut farming, which I used to do uh, a long time ago, um, the words breakthrough were often used and they were actually spread across the headlines. And it's not that easy. It's not that easy. So anytime I see the word breakthrough, I'm, I'm going, whoops, what, what have they misunderstood? How difficult is this work? Um, so, yeah, the attention grabbing is okay, but you have to have the stuff to follow up. And the humor, if you're trying to make, it's like telling a joke in the middle of a speech. If I had, if I had a joke prepared, it would probably fall flat. So, you know, it has to be, it has to be something inherent in the topic or some, something that you're making use. So, use this, yes, but be aware that it isn't a fail-safe. Okay. What else have we got? You guys, what did you do? Um, I think that first we should uh, explain why it's um, important. And how would you do that? Uh, for example, uh, uh, we can uh, expand it on this way. We can uh, swim, we can uh, uh, rest, or we can uh, drink this water. Okay. So, so the drinkability of yeah. the water. Yeah. yeah. Everything, everything what, what after we would like to start the uh, explanation from uh, simple stuff uh, to more complicated mm -hmm. stuff. And then and also we, uh, we think that uh, we should um, avoid the um, very uh, <coughs> difficult uh, 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 scientific words. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, work. Right? Any concrete ideas of what you wanted to do? What, what would be a good idea? Just for example. Uh, we can use photographs, pictures. Yeah. Oh, and and a, photo, a good photograph, a well used photograph, really says a lot. <coughs> yeah? How about you guys? Uh, also, oh, yeah? May I add something? Uh, for example, we can uh, um, compare. Uh, a quality of our lake, mm -hmm. a river, with, uh, with um, a quality of um, running water. So I can tell it with uh, something very, very uh, uh, popular who knows everything. I mean... Uh, yeah, so you relate it to something that everybody has in their yes. daily life. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. It's not the one that necessarily guides you, because your story will be different. How about you guys? Uh, we start with the, our story. That on the day um, uh, we did sampling, uh -huh. one guy asked us, what are we doing? Then uh, we tell him that uh, we uh, assess the water quality of this stream. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, I want to know, because I drink water here every day. And then our conclusion and I, our interpretation for our results to Mina is that this uh, stream, you can drink water there. Right. It's good. Yeah. But the other stream is a neat uh, thing to, say, to tell, right. but we start with that. Okay. Uh, that's and what that's they want to know, that we want to match audience interest. Yes, yes, match audience interest. That's a good idea. Yes. Yeah. Also, appeal to emotion, right? Empathy, because my site is a breeding ground, like a kindergarten. Fish, so. Say it again. Like a kindergarten for fish. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, why not? That's a nice way to sort of anthropomorphize to make the fish sort of. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's the breeding ground. How about you guys? What did you get? Uh, um, uh, 
in in our result, we have uh, some conflicting result from mm -hmm. TCB and uh, and biodiversity. Right. And and the most abundant species in bio in in this lake we sample is Daphnia, and I and, and we 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 interact with the the, the safe of Daphnia and E. coli as well. So uh, we. We we are going to uh, start with the, the sculpture uh, of Daphnia and E. coli, like oh, yeah. something like uh, two sides of uh, one result, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in fact, that's great. That's great because conflicting results is a drama within your story, and you can use that. As, a, as part of the narrative. Okay? We are hardwired for understanding stories. The campfire in the cave and all that stuff, we told stories. We are hardwired to understand stories. And this drama thing, the conflicting results or what you don't know and so on, is actually a very good element to focus on. If what you had is it's unclear, explain how it makes you feel. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. that's a very good album. What else you get? Uh, we were thinking about making a game between the bad results and the good results, and then the good results maybe can win. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. And in fact, there's, I've been thinking about game format for lots of stuff, but yeah, that's a possibility. Yeah. Because it is, in a way, it's, uh, what we are measuring in science is always sort of the balance of forces. Is there anything else we've got here? Yes? Most of the time in uh, the presentations that I see, yeah? the basic uh, to grab the attention of the audience is like uh, to, uh, to ask them some questions, to engage the audience. Like I did just now, right? Yeah. yeah. So that, yeah. that you can grab the attention and that right. you can uh, tell the story. Right. Like, uh, that's and that's start, start your stories from the, the audience point of view. Audience involvement. That's actually a very effective way of doing it. Because I saw some of you closing your eyes or almost dropping off this morning, despite the wonderful videos. Um, but it was early in the morning, and I know. And, and uh, your activity level is completely different now than it was between eight and nine. So audience involvement is a very effective way of getting people into your point. And we have just shown it this morning. Okay, you've felt it. And there's ways of getting your audience, you can ask them questions, or you can, uh, you can make them participate in some kind of little, uh, little survey, game, whatever. But be careful about what you're doing because Various things can go various ways, and, and frankly, I know that some great ideas are stopped by facts in the audience and so on. Um, any, anything else? Oh, don't tell me you run out of ideas. Yeah. Uh, you could play on the audience emotions. Yes. By, like, for us, we have really bad uh, water quality right next to a school for children between the age of 6 and 12 so we can ask like how many of you guys have children right and then we like would you want your children to be the school so, yeah 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 and that uh, okay so there's there's a couple of things like the appeal to the emotion is very common and uh, and the uh, the appeal uh, matching to your audience is utterly important. So I wouldn't talk the same way to scientists as I would to a high school cl class, as I would to uh, a smaller class. I would I would have boiled down the message, and and made it really simple and possibly use different techniques. But matching your audience is pretty important. And relatively speaking, thinking about Nina is not a bad idea here, because she she's surrounded by intelligent people all day long whose work she vaguely understands, probably doesn't really care about on a day-to-day -day basis, but you can make her care. 
You can do that tap water thing, you know? You can do something pretty easy, but you can make them care, and you can get your point across, and you can make them enjoy the point, like with that flame challenge thing, you know? At the beginning, I saw you go, you know, and by the end, it was like, oh, wow, there's a lot of good ideas there. There's really a lot of good ideas there. So you want them to remember as well. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the, the tricky part here. Let's see if I can get this going here. So, um, and I'll just finish off with a, a little bit there. This is a four minute thing. And let's see. years ago, I experienced a bit of what it must have been like to be Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, she's Penn State asked me, a communications teacher, to teach a communications class for engineering students. And I was scared. <laughs> really scared. Scared of these students with their big brains and their big books and their big unfamiliar words. But as these conversations unfolded, I experienced what Alice must have when she went down that rabbit hole and saw that door to a whole new world. That's just how I felt as I had those conversations with the students. I was amazed at the ideas that they, that they had, and I wanted others to experience this wonderland as well. And I believe the key to opening that door is great communication. We desperately need great communication from our scientists and engineers in order to change the world. Our scientists and engineers are the ones that are tackling our grandest challenges from That's energy you. to That's environment you. to healthcare, among others. And if we don't know about it and understand it, then the work isn't done. And I believe it's our responsibility as non-scientists to have these interactions. But these great conversations can't occur if our scientists and engineers don't invite us in to see their wonderland. So scientists and engineers, please talk nerdy to us. I want to share a few keys on how you can do that to make sure that we can see that your science is sexy and that your engineering is engaging. First question to answer for us, so what? Tell us why your science is relevant to us. Don't just tell me that you study trabeculae, but tell me that you study trabeculae, which is the mesh-like structure of our bones, because it's important to understanding and treating osteoporosis. And when you're describing your science, beware of jargon. Jargon is a barrier to our understanding of your ideas. Sure, you can say spatial and temporal, but why not just say space and time, which is so much more accessible to us. And making your ideas accessible is not the same as dumbing it down. Instead, as That's Einstein key. said, make everything as simple as possible, but no simpler. You can clearly communicate your science without compromising the ideas. A few things to consider are having examples, stories, and analogies. Those are ways to engage and excite us about your content. And when presenting your work, drop the bullet points. Have you ever wondered why they're called bullet points? <laughs> what do bullets do? Bullets kill, and they will kill your presentation. Yeah. A slide like this is not only boring, but it relies too much on the language area of our brain and causes us to become overwhelmed. Instead, this example slide by Genevieve Brown is much more effective. It's showing that the special structure of trabeculae are so strong that they actually inspired the unique design of the Eiffel Tower. And the trick here is to use a single readable sentence that the audience can key into if they get a bit lost, and then provide visuals which appeal to our other senses and create a deeper sense of understanding or the of what's can being be described. Data. So I think these are just a few keys that can help the rest of us to open that door and see the wonderland that is science and engineering. And because the engineers that I've worked with have taught me uh, to become really in touch with my inner nerd, I want to summarize with an equation. Take your science, subtract your bullet points and your jargon, divide by relevance, meaning share what's relevant to the audience, and multiply it by the passion that you have for this incredible work that you're doing. And that is going to equal incredible interactions that are full of understanding. And so scientists and engineers, when you've solved this equation, by all means, talk nerdy to me. <laughs>
What? So we've got we've got about a month to prepare those final presentations. Start thinking about what your story is. Start thinking about how you're going to get it across. Remember, I'm going to be going through all your texts and make sure that the texts are scientifically correct because you have to do a thesis out of whatever's coming at you. Uh, but when you're communicating, it's a whole different story. Um, and I'll be setting up dates with my groups so that we start to build this story on techniques that we know are effective. And that's that. So, so oh, one more thing. This afternoon, there are different ways of learning things. And this, this one here, We'll, uh, we'll, do, uh, we'll use the emotion, the logic, and, uh, I don't know, can you see that? Yes. This one here, an Oxford style debate, it's a competition. It's not the Norwegian style of debate where you're seeking consensus. This is one team versus the other. And it's from uh, at 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock in Pudefjord. That's in B block, I think it's up on the third or fourth floor. And uh, the, the question here is, are the benefits of aquaculture correct? And we've got one team that says yes, and one team that says no, quite clearly. And they're doing it, uh, the, the debate itself should be done within about a half an hour. And they, the audience votes about whether or not they're convinced. Um, and as a teaching tool, we've got two of team yes here. How's it been for, for learning? How's it been as a teaching tool, just to prepare for this? Uh, yeah, um, preparing for a scientific debate extremely stressful because it's not politics, you can't just use nice words, you have to be, re you have to be rigorous. really sure about yeah. what you're saying. Right. And since a lot of the people who's going to be there are aquaculture biologists, uh, I can't make up <laughs> No, you can't make it up. Anything at all. So uh, a lot of preparing more than you would think. Yeah. And you like this class, you really need to think about how to present things. Yeah. Right. So I'd encourage you guys to come and see the debate itself and, you know, vote on team yes or team no uh, and, and just basically respond there. But also for those who are going to end up being teachers in other places, the, the, uh, the use of an Oxford style debate as a teaching tool is incredibly effective, even for those who are not on the teams. So, uh, yeah, I'll... I hope I'll see you in about five hours, and uh, if not, see you uh, next class. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> it's in fifth floor, by the way. It's in fifth floor, okay. Oh. <laughs> I can work on the introduction to Interesting Norwegian stuff. I guess maybe we should at least say in the end a bit about what else we've got to measure. Yeah, stuff. I'll get that report up with the <laughs> one that said like all the different ones. And then